Hey guys, it's Doran Coach with Tactical Hive. And in today's video, we're gonna be going over training, the importance of it. And we're gonna give you some examples of when we were in, we got ourselves into a little bit of a predicament and we're about to die and our training got us through. So up next. Before we get into today's video, we wanna to thank today's sponsor, Vetter Holsters. You know, um, if you own a pistol, a pistol needs a holster, go ahead and check them out in the description below. Well, they can pretty much match you up with any major make model handgun of your choosing, then they're gonna have an answer for you. So go ahead and check them out. They're a great uh, friend of the channel. We'd also like to thank our other sponsors, Laser Ammo, CCW Safe, and Dry Fire Bag. You know, these guys make uh, this content possible and they bring it to you free of charge. So go ahead and check them out in the description below when you get a chance. So today's video um, is coming straight to you on YouTube, but these types of videos where we kind of reach back into our former job and give you, um, you know, firsthand accounts of what worked, what didn't work and what it was like. We really, we try to, you know, tend to save that stuff for our War Room community. If you guys aren't familiar with that, we have an exclusive community called War Room and you can go ahead and check that out as well in the description below if you're interested. We're gonna be opening that back up to the community here fairly soon you can get on the wait list if you're interested but um, again bud back to today's video it's all about training so you know obviously you know in our former job we spent the majority of our time training more so than anything else even sleeping and um you know they kept telling us you know two things i remember going from day one of training all the way through my career take care of your gear your gear will take care of you and you know, always do your best, always try to make every rep as perfect as possible because you're gonna to sink to the lowest level of that training that you have. And that training and that properly functioning equipment is really what's gonna get you and your teammates through. You're gonna be pulling each other through as needed, but there are times when it's just you against the world. Mm. And uh, both of the example near-death experiences we're gonna to talk to about today was really just kind of us by ourselves in the dark fighting for our lives so to speak <laughs> yeah all right yeah so it's a joke uh, going through training or talking about are you getting full benefit you know the full benefit of training but it's it's not really a joke i mean you you want to get as much as you can out of every rep uh and then you also want to train to a higher standard than what you think you're actually going to have to deal with in real life and that makes you know that that real life situation that much easier to get through now Skydiving is one of those things that uh, it's real. <laughs> it's real life, even in training, because mm -hmm. if you screw up, you're a, you, you'll be a dead man. Um, but you need to get comfortable with it. And you start off just you know jumping out of airplanes, slick, uh, getting used to the gear, and then slowly we add more stuff to you. So that's combat equipment, combat equipment um, with O2, and you start doing. Uh, halos that's high altitude low opening and hay hose high altitude high opening spent a lot of time under canopy so we started doing real high altitude jumps um, the highest jump i got to do was thirty-five thousand feet and let me tell you it's cold up there and the wind does weird stuff mm -hmm. but you know you have to you have to believe you know in that in your heart that you can do this and you just do it Otherwise, you'd never get out of that airplane. Mm -hmm. um, I think pure pressure <laughs> yeah. plays a big part. Yeah, you don't want I'm to I'm flying on the ground. Thanks to you, yeah. You know, I'm fine putting the stuff on. But once I get into the plane and it takes off, it's all pure pressure at that point. Like, if you guys are doing it, I'll go. Yeah. Like, I'll go. I'm going. But, you know, just my own personal feeling on jumping in general. <laughs> I just do it because the other guys are doing it. Well, we were doing a uh, 25,000-foot um, unknown DZ uh hey ho or no it was a halo so high altitude low opening and um so when it's dark you've got your altimeter and it has a battery so you can see it you know uh a little light that comes on see it at night and in case that goes bad you've got a, uh, a chem light little mini chem light that just snapped there right well when it's really really cold sometimes the chem lights don't work and sometimes your battery just goes out for no reason and so you know having two systems on there should be good enough well this particular time it wasn't um so i exited the air, aircraft with uh some of my closest friends and immediately after you know get clear of the plane go and check my altimeter 
and nothing. Just black. Can't see a damn thing. So, I, okay. Buy the book. The book answer to that one is pull your chute. I'm at 25,000 feet, sucking oxygen, got supplemental oxygen on, so you got the oxygen mask, whole nine yards. I'm not doing that. So I decided just to hang. And my decision then at that point was to find another one of my guys because we had, uh, you had a, a red chem light on the front, a green chem light on the back. So once you're under canopy, if you see a red light coming at you, that means he's coming this way and you, everybody turns their right toggle and you miss each other. The green on the back is so you can find you guys and line up the green lights and, you know, and while you're under canopy. Well, I find a buddy of mine not too far away, got his green chem light, and I'm just just flying, staring at him, staying right on there. And, you know, just hanging in, hanging in. I figure when, when I see that chem light go and go up, that means he pulled. That'll be about time for me to go. So... I'm flying, I'm watching this happening, and then you notice right around 10,000 feet, it gets a lot warmer. And I know we were briefed, we were pulling about 3,500, so like, okay, it's coming up. So as we're, we're falling along, I see his, his green chem light and just go and, and you know, gup, start going up fast. So I'll reach in, and just as I'm grabbing from my rip cord, another guy I didn't, hadn't seen before, rolled right underneath me, stole my air, kind of threw me in, you know, it throws you off. You're falling on that pillar of air, and when somebody comes underneath you, it, 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 there's that verbal. And uh, so I started doing that, and I was like, oh, I ain't got time for this. So about the second shake, I pulled and shoot open, shook it out, and I was right in the stack where I was supposed to be. Got in line, we landed, all nice little group, as if nothing ever happened. Now, had I gone by the book and opened as soon as I'd seen that I couldn't see my altimeter, then that would have changed everything. I'd have still been in the air when everybody else was on the ground. I'd have been missing. The winds up there were pretty stiff, so I'd have probably been, oh, a mile downwind or more. Um, and, you know, it would have changed the whole op. And had, had that happened in a, in a real life situation, oh, you're screwed. You know, you got a guy missing, op's over, now you're the op. You don't want to be that. And so that's the kind of thing. Once you, you push that envelope a little bit farther, then when you come back, you can you can think about and understand what's going on and make those critical decisions. Even though they're not by the book, but I never felt unsafe at any point. And it was like, ah, I, this is just a modification I had to do um, during the uh, the event. But, right. Anyway, so you're the primary and yeah, secondary yeah. altimeter... Primary and secondary light from my altimeter. Shit the bed. On a night halo. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. It's gonna happen. Um, yeah, you know, just trust your gut, follow your training. In this instance, you know, you decided to, to drive to bleed off some altitude. I was gonna ask you, you know, like you could see the other guys in the you know, in the fall, you know, fallen you were fallen with that you jumped with, and that's good. So now you got a chem light, you got something to read off of, something to gauge off of. Because, uh, man, being up there at night, it is just darkness. There's no horizon. Oh, we were out in the desert. It was a moonless yeah. night. It was, <laughs> it was Africa dark out there. You know, you're just, all you've got is your instruments. And luckily, each other. <laughs> That's why, I, you know, good, good thing you weren't the low guy. Right on. So my, um, my story for today's segment, as far as, uh, you know, believe in your training, uh, was in the water. And it actually happened to me twice, both at night uh, one was work related going through the surf zone with a lot of equipment on and I had a uh, gear malfunction Where the op was you know, we we go in do what we got to do X fill and then there was a uh, agent planted dive gear Cached and we were going to use that to uh, X fill the area because they couldn't come in and get us by whatever means if that if memory serves um, so we went in, did our thing. We came out, we went to the 10 digit grid. We, you know, the agent was very lazy and the cache, which was, you know, easy enough for us to get it all on. But I did not pre-dive this equipment. This is all done for us. Wait, this is the open circuit or is this the Yes, yeah, this is the trigger. Oh, geez. So this is all freaking getting the stuff on and, uh, trusting that agent, man. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so we went ahead, 
got everything on, got into the water, started going through the surf. And there was a legit surf. Nothing to write home about, but it was San Clemente Island, mm. you know, down there off of uh, Bud's Beach-ish area. Oh, yeah. Farther oh, down, Grad break. Beach. Yeah. Grad, Grad Beach down there towards the point. End of the, yeah, end of the runway. Feet of water. And, um, you know, down there where all those FTXs, villages and things were. And, uh, yeah, we were heading through the water and um, we we're supposed to go on status before we went through the waves, you know, just kind of get into your purge. And uh, it just wasn't working. And uh, I wasn't able to get it all set. I wasn't able to do my, my checks because we were in a hurry and we were going and I was young. You know, I wasn't anywhere near being in charge or anything like that. So I just kind of went along with what we were, because we were going very far. Mm. It was going to be an index. It was just a matter of getting everybody together. Yeah, past the surf. Surf. You got to get past the surf zone, then you pass out the lizard line and get ready for transit. You're not going to be tethered to anybody going through a surf zone. That's just not going to happen. You know, and you had all your other stuff. So anyway, that happened. Uh, we went through and it wasn't working. And I started basically drowning in the surf zone by myself. And, uh, Things weren't working correctly and it ended up uh, it not working at all. I never went on status and never went down and it was fine. But um, yeah, if you're going to, for any reason, put on dive gear, make sure you're the one checking it out and putting it together. So what was up with the rig? What was wrong with it? Oh, it just was not uh, pre-dove yeah. properly. The oxygen wasn't on all the way. It was just a fucking mess. I should have white lighted and gone through it right there, but we were in scenario. I mean, we were wearing face paint for crying out loud. You know, this is a nighttime FTX kind of thing. But yeah, that uh, that occurred. That was the first time. The second time, totally different set of circumstances. Wreck diving, open circuit, and uh, the gear was fine. I just lost a fin in the surf zone, mm -hmm. and again in the surf, all that equipment on, and uh, you know, just was like trying to get through the surf zone, get back to the rocks, and we were going through rocks. This is stuff that you would never in a million years probably do anyway, unless you were actually had gone through all of the crazy stuff we'd gone through. And um, it was it was a little touch and go. It was dangerous. I got separated from everybody because everybody else was kind of powering through. Because you're not, you don't go through a surf zone on the surface. You're cutting down underneath the waves. The deeper you can get underneath the wave, the less force you have to work against. And you're pushing through with full double tank open circuit gear. Yeah, rip currents as yeah, well. Yeah, you know. all of that. So, you know, I was by myself. I'd lost a fin. Things weren't going quite well. But I was able to work my way out of it twice. And had I not had that second phase training, had I not had that blacked out dive mask, you know, nighttime training as we did in the swimming pools under observation, I don't know if I'd still be here. Pool competency, man. Yeah, that, that pool cop really worked stopped, out. But it's so... Uh, and that really what separates, you know, maritime special operations from... You know, the other ones, the land-based ones. As far as I know, the, you know, the Navy is in charge of all the dive training, both open and closed circuit and the rec, the rec in requirements and prereqs it requires to get to higher levels of training. But I think the SF school, as well as whatever the Marines are going through on the, the Raider, as well as force recon side is, is, is the same thing. And that starts with the pool skills that we do in first phase. Yeah, pool you skills. Know, not tying, drought proofing, all that. That's all a lead up to the dive portion. And, uh, you know, I didn't really think much of that stuff going through training. It was just kind of a hurdle you had to get through to get to the team. But, you know, everything at the team was land-based, you know, a little bit of maritime, a little bit of air. So I really wasn't too worried about it going through it. But obviously you got to pass every test, do everything correctly. And um, I'm honest, honestly, you know, I, I think uh, Bud's, because without it, I probably would have, well, hey, I wouldn't have been doing what I was doing on the first one because I was about as Navy SEAL as it gets. Yeah. And uh, the second one um, definitely saved me. So, you know, don't take any training, you know, no matter what it is, if you're going through a pipeline or you're at a unit that requires, you know, kind of in-depth, you know, maybe even crazy to some people training, please take that stuff seriously and, uh, you know, believe in it because, mm. you know, both all three of these situations, you know, the two in the water with me and then the the one, the free fall with coach, you don't have time to think up there. You know, Maverick said it best, you know, you think you're dead and uh, you don't, everything's happening so fast, especially free fall. Free fall is basically a gunfight. You know, you're just like using your skills and your equipment to get yourself out of certain death. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and then alone in the dark and the surf has its challenges. And, you know, just remembering your training, 
taking your training seriously got us through. And that has nothing to do with any of the actual like violent encounter operational stuff. This yeah. was just... I mean, the environment yeah. we train for is... That, that'll kill you faster than a bullet. Yeah. You know, and, that, and it does. The whole idea. <laughs> you know, we both have friends and, and colleagues that died in training, both in the air and underwater. And it does claim guys. And, um, you know, sometimes it just, for whatever reason, it does get you. But 99.9 something percent of the time, those emergency procedures and just being conditioned to stay calm and focus in on those skill sets that were ingrained into you is what gets you through. Yeah, and the, the heart of the training, the calmer you can be, you know, when the deal actually happens. That's been my experience. So, I mean, take your training seriously, get everything out of it, get the full benefit every time. So anyway, guys, you know, this is just a couple of quick sea stories about how training was able to get us through some tough uh, spots we found ourselves in that we got ourselves into. Um, gear does fail, you know, redundancies are important. Having a buddy nearby enough to help you and bail you out whenever possible, you know, is definitely a plus, but in these instances, we didn't really have it based on the environment, you know, being really close to somebody, being tethered to somebody in a surf zone is extremely dangerous. So we don't do it. Being super close to somebody in free fall, especially at night wearing combat equipment is extremely dangerous. You know, wind does weird things. People cut underneath you. <laughs> I got, I had a meteor collision on one of my very first jumps at the team. And, uh, you know, you're falling past a hundred miles an hour. Any, any bump can be, uh, can hurt. And it did, but you know, you know, again, not that big of a deal, but, um, you know, you just gotta, again, remember your training, believe in your training and take care of your gear. Cause your gear will take care of you mm -hmm. and stay calm. Yeah. Stay calm and work through it. Uh, panicking is only going to make the uh, situation worse. Mm -hmm. The best way to keep from panicking is through training, repetition, 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 and understanding when to deviate from the uh, the plan. Well, guys, uh, you know, remember, you're just going to, you don't rise to the level of the occasion. You sink to the lowest level of your training. All righty, guys. Thanks for being here. The Doran Coach, out.